It's the boogie man, however y'all want to put it. And I'm here to give a shout out to my guys. I love listening to John, Charles, and Frank on Real Talk Boxing. Okay, we are back on the Ultimate Sports Network. This is Real Boxing Talk. We have just tested the live version of Real Boxing Talk. Um, the, 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 the beta test is in. Results are, eh, we'll work it out for you, folks. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So you all have to get up on Wednesday morning at 4.30 a.m. to watch this show because it's the rest, best thing going on with your grits and ham and whatever. What the hell is he doing? <laughs> oh, he, he thought he was on TikTok. I'm sorry. We'll be on TikTok soon. So that's it. We're on TikTok soon. You ready for my call up? You know what I'm saying? Come on. Come on. Right, there we go. Cecil B. DeMille is nowhere near here, so just chill, all right? Cecil okay. No. Yeah, I know. I know. I think like you're going to go back that yeah. far. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I was going to go Glory Swanson, but I figured no one would come no. up with that one at all. So, anyway, yeah. all right. So, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the lady that invented the TV dinner, shut up. Okay. So, no, don't go by that. That's that's fake news. Fake news. Yeah, that that's actually wasn't because that was the, the that was the uh, Tyson people. So anyhow, I thought that was Gloria Steinem that made the TV. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw a special on that and how that started. But that's another story. It was it wasn't Clarence Birdseye, by the way. It was it was the anyhow. okay. So here we go. We wasted eight minutes not talking about real boxing. We're talking about boxing. Um. A couple of things that have happened in the last few weeks and a couple of things that I think are interesting. One, we kind of forgot Mauricio Lar was fighting last week. I don't know how we for- missed that one. Um, one of the guys that we kind of like to see, but we for- forgot about that. Apologize to Mr. Lar. Forget about it. Just didn't bring it up. <laughs> well, okay. That's, that's a better way of putting it. I was trying to be nice. Um, let's, okay, Charles, let's start with Chocolatito and we'll roll from there. Yeah, well, uh, the the elder statesman, as they call him, Chocolate T, that was not 34 now, working on 35. Uh, I thought he was 42. Nah, not yet. I don't know. <laughs> Chocolate T, Gonzalez, uh, faced off versus a youngster, Julio Cesar Gonzalez, uh, who was uh, stepping in basically to replace Francisco Estrada. They were supposed to have a rematch, Chocolate Tito, that is. But... Uh, Young man jumped in. He was very, very uh, active. I had a lot of power, and uh, he was game. And early on, he started jumping out and started throwing some some punches that started hitting. Uh, AKA my buddy Chocolatito. Start tapping him up a little bit, but then it changed. So the boxing lesson changed. The boxing lesson began, and Chocolatito saw where this young man was very aggressive, sometimes somewhat too aggressive. And he simply waited him out. So you put your guards up high and you wait and you move slowly but surely, then you start to move forward, which is what he did. So while the young man is trying to hit all of the punches instead of throwing uppercuts, which will come up here and to the side, everything's coming straight forward and allowed Chocolatito to move forward. So basically, from a standpoint early on, he gave him a boxing lesson. He made him feel somewhat quite frustrated. Um, it's one of those things where I just say this and I get off this real quick. So I'm gonna take too much time, but it's when you like when you do something, try to figure out a problem. First thing you're supposed to do, you're supposed to dissect the problem, right? Understand it, see what you're doing, come out what you how you go. And then after you dissect it and you understand the plan, how you can break it down, then you dismantle the situation. And that's literally what Chocolatito did in the win. And the young man was trying, he was somewhat frustrated. He was a gamer, he refused to quit. Uh, he was not, he was that tough. And he, they said he used to beat people up in his neighborhood and used to fight all the time. But sometimes just because you're hardcore and physical and tough doesn't mean you win. Sometimes you have to be smart, have to be uh, able to calculate and understand it. And again, Chocolatito literally dismantled him after he dissected him. And he showed you even at 34, working on 35, he is still a person to be reckoned with in that division and other places too. He was simply amazing and still one of my favorite fighters right now because of the way he just does it. He does it the way an older aging champion is supposed to do it and forces younger guys and even guys that may be around his age to come and literally take what he has. You have to earn it. 
He doesn't give it away because he's older. No disrespect to Manny Pacquiao, but he's still in the game. And uh, for as long as he wants to so far till his self kind of declines, he's still going to be a player. You know, John, he brought up a point. And I'm going to go completely off what little script we have uh, and ask the question. Yeah, I know. Throw the show notes away. It ain't happening. Um, the difference between boxing and say a tough man and MMA. What is the difference that makes boxing to you so much better? Because what he just said was a, a point of, I can go out and beat up people, but I can't box them. I'm trying to figure out as, I'm, as we're seeing the, the rele relevance of MMA more and more, I'm trying to understand the difference between, and from someone who's followed what is the difference between these things? Other than just obviously one you can wrestle and all that. What is the difference in your mind that makes boxing better? Well, what Charles was describing what Chocolatito did was the sweet science. That's what he did. He dissected and then he defeated. And he did it in such a sweet way like the Chocolatito. He's just as tough as, as, as Gonzalez. Just as tough. He's just as hardcore. But he's got technique. He's got brains. And this was the best thing that happened to that kid because he saw there's another way you can fight. You don't walk out there throwing bombs. Because I had seen this kid completely destroy a guy in England by the name of Charlie Edwards. And he, that was why I was waffling last week, if you remember. I gave right, him right. a little bit of an edge because I thought he might get old. And, and, he is so cool in there. I mean, if you really want to watch what a professional is, that's him. And then the other thing is, is that he didn't do what so many of these guys do. He could have said, I'm fighting that guy. He could have did what Canelo does. Who is he? Who is that guy? He doesn't bring anything to the table. Is he right? Well, yeah. He didn't really bring anything to the table. Most people were like, who? So, Chocolatito is what we were talking about last week. He is what a real fighter is. One guy gets COVID, Estrada, he backs, he can't do it. They offer this, yeah, yeah, I'll fight him, no problem. That's the way it's supposed to do, he's supposed to do. The concern, of course, was his age and, and but I believe what they said. They said he's got a nutritionist now. He's not ballooning up 30 or 40 pounds before or after fights. He's staying in shape. He understands his age. And you talk about a master class performance. Right, right. Kind of reminiscent of what Charles was telling us with that show that he did with the young men when he was talking about things about basketball. I mean, that that was just that was just an education in depth and in levels. And, and that's, and back to what your question was, Frank, I'm not a big MMA fan, as you know, most of those guys, those guys are hardcore guys, nothing against them. They're tough guys, but usually the guy that I've seen a few times, I could be wrong here, so I'm qualified. The guy that wins, other than like a Conor McGregor sometimes, but he's the guy that's got a little bit more in his game than just throwing bombs. He's a little bit more well-rounded. He's a better kicker. He's a better this. And then you segue to Chocolatito and that's what he is. He does everything well, and he swarms you, and he's active, and, and his punches are straight, and he, he, he rolls with the punches. I mean, he really is what, the, what I said, and that's how I'll end it. He is the sweet science, and a little five foot three inch, 114-pound guy who wouldn't even come up here if he was standing here. Chuck, he, where are you stand up? I am standing. Oh, just the camera, right, yeah. <laughs> he, I mean, I was more impressed with that guy well, other than when he won the championship again, that was about the coolest thing. But I bet, you know, obviously, that was no fluke. He is back. He he is almost as good as he was when he was in his twenties, which is amazing. And the sad part for me is a lot of boxing fans aren't realizing what a gem this man is. Right, right. And he's only got maybe two or three more fights, and he's talking about moving up to fight the monster, Charles. And he'll do it. He'll do it, right? I want him to because it's a monster, but he's he's a fighter. That's his mentality. So okay, what's well, up, Charles? Go, Charles. 
Yeah, Charles is like, he'll see. So that's Jack Chocolatito. It's like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll move on and fight him. So all everything to Chocolatito, he is the real deal. Well, this, I, I was, when he mentioned, when Charles said what he said, I was thinking of guys that like, a, for example, a Greg Howden, who won a title, but actually won a couple of titles, I think about it. But when push came to shove against a boxer, he was in trouble. Now, to say that he didn't maximize, well, I think he did a great job. Or like a Butterbean or somebody like that, or a, um, who am I thinking of? Tex Cobb. You know, you're, you're going to get in the ring and maximize what you do, but there's going to be somebody that has more boxing skill. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned, uh, Charles mentioned, this is the best lesson this young man could have had. And I go to, and again, we, we seem like we're bowing at the altar of this guy, but when Canelo fought Floyd Mayweather, best thing that could happen, I think, to Canelo was to come up across that guy and understand there's more to this than just going out and taking people out. I've got to figure out the business of it, the business of being in the ring. How do I do this? Because, you know, I remember that fight and thinking, this kid's good, but he's not good enough yet. Right. He has to learn how it works and how to do it. And he's applied that. And again, you might say he's ducking people. I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into that. You guys could do that. But please do. That's what I want you to do right now. But anyway, but the idea being he understands what he's supposed to do. And when he's in the ring, he's in charge. And you think about just in the pantheon of bo excuse me, boxing, but, you know, you've got the Rocky Marcianos of the world that just went, I'm going to go through people, but had more skill than getting credit for. But a lot of the times, it's the guy, the Sugar Ray Leonard, the Muhammad Ali's, you know, the guys that have not only heart and will, but skill to go with it. So, you know, we can go a lot of different ways, but I'm going to ask Charles a question that I'm, I'm trying to form in my head as I'm babbling here. But the idea of if we were to build the perfect fighter and we were to say, this is what we want is this, the qualification. What do you think? Give me two things and John will give us two things. Two things that the perfect fighter or the, the great fighter has to have. Wow. Oh. Uh... Wow, that's deep. I'll, first of course, that's why I asked you. First of all, I got to say, uh, you guys, I say defense, and that might surprise you, you know, because I think about Floyd Mayweather, and for as much as I think about him otherwise, uh, that's one of the things I'm really, uh, you know, his defense is really key because that can help you and also, too. And the other thing I'm going to throw, because I'm going to make it hard for John to come up with something I know he's capable of, I think another uh, skill had to be you got to have a jab, man. You gotta have a jab. You, you just got the great ones have jabs, and they may not. You may not notice it, but they have the right to jab. They can jab, and they know how to defend themselves. A la, you know, Andre Ward when in trouble. You know, you, you can do those things. You can, you can hide when you need to until until you need to get back, get yourself your faculties back if you're in trouble. So jab and uh, in defense. Okay, so before we go to job, we're gonna we're gonna kind of round table, round robin this kind of thing. All right, so with those two qualities, and we can add other stuff with it, but those two qualities, John, three guys that have that have had those two qualities and become champions. Well, Larry Holmes had a great jab, right? Muhammad Ali had a great jab. Joe Lewis had a great jab. So there, there's that. In defense, obviously, Andre Ward, you mentioned him, great defense. Floyd <laughs> Combine, combine the two, jab and defense. Don't separate them. Okay. Combine them how? You mean how they fought? Well, they say, yeah. They said, this guy was a great defender, and he had a great jab. Okay. Well, with Andre, I'll move on to work since I saw him so many times, and Charles saw Mark Floyd more than I did. Yeah, he, he, but he had another quality. He was very smart, and that's another thing that, that works in with a guy like that. Uh, his jab was solid. He, was, he, he, he dissected opponents. Uh, uh, when I saw him fight, and and when Muhammad Ali was the same way. His jab and his 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 his, his smarts. His defense was more solid because he was faster when he was younger. As he got older, he had. If I could segue into what I I think makes a great fighter, Frank, two things that it's a, it's an inner thing that you either have or you don't. You have that drive, that determination, that I will not quit Muhammad Ali. 
for example, Andre Ward, another with Kovalev. I will not lay down before you. I will fight you to the end. And then the determination to do it, the determination to do what you need to do to get to that that point. And there are some guys that have some of those qualities, but to be great, you have to have, I think, all of them to be great. Because I don't throw that word around very much, as you know. So you have, you have to have all of them. You don't, have to have, you don't have to have the hardest shit in the world or the best jab, but you have a little bit of everything. Like Sugar Ray Robinson also had a very good jab. He was loaded with guts, as we know, right? He had those skills. He was fast. He could knock you out. He had that to be great. So to, to, to hit that plateau, you have to have all of that. And then the last thing was defense. And I was going to say about Floyd Mayweather, watching, I'm smiling because I can remember so well watching him from media row against Andre Berto and against uh, uh, right, right. Uh, and the fights that I went to. And it was, it was almost, and I mean this not nice because the ghost was trying as hard as he could, but it was almost funny the way he would do it it was just like uh it was just like a flailing yeah well and it was a professor and a student the same thing i mean by the second round you could already see that he's got okay i'm lining you up for the lead right i loved how he did that and but then when the, when the guy would be coming he'd be moving you know and and again back to chocolatito you love these little segues frank that was the sweet science with what he was doing. And that's also what makes a great fighter. You don't have to have all of those things in abundance, but I think you have to have some of them and that creates the greatness. Well, I'm going to go off board. You're going to go, both of you are going to go, really? He went there? Um, you won't be surprised, Frank. You won't be surprised, right? Um, I'm going to go, and I, I always get them mixed up. I'm going to, and I'm not bestowing greatness upon it. I'm not doing that. But actually, I could do it either one. one. Either one of the Klitschko's. Because it was throw the jab out there and don't get hit. Now, that's all they did. But that's what it was. I don't know if it was great defense or they stayed back. But watch the fights that they won. It was keeping people at bay with the jab. That was the entire fight. Again, I'm not saying greatness. I'm just saying that's what it was. And if you watch the fights that they won, that's what they did. And that's what they relied on. Tyson Fury is kind of the same way. I'm going to throw this. It's not a... a phenomenal jab but it's out there in your face i'm going to put it out there so you've got to get through it and once you get through it now you gotta get through 280 pounds to get to me and that's where i think wilder had problems trying to get through him not necessarily because it was peekaboo or whatever it's like i'm just a bigger guy you got to get through me so that's part of the defense i think and then you look at somebody like uh, i i would say larry holmes but i'm not sure i will put the defense there because the jab was so good i don't think he had to be that great of a defender but i know what you're saying um but it's the idea of, I'm going to set you up for something. But, oh, there's what I was going to do. George Foreman. The older George Foreman, especially. You know, I'm going to do this. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I'm not, it's not like I've got to throw 300 jabs around, but I'm going to keep you away from me. And I think that's what the jab is. The jab can do two things. It can get you inside and it keep you away. And off balance. Yeah, and off balance. And so, you know, you have some guys that were like Ali's jab, you know, you think, well, this doesn't do any damage. But three rounds later, it's like this guy's eye is about ready to fall out of his head. You know, it looks like a flick, but it's consistent. It's accurate. You know, and at that time, his defense was a speed. Yeah. So and when it got to, like you said, now you get to the heart, you get to the will. Uh, for some reason, you made me think of a, uh, of a Don Henley song. I don't know why. I will not lie down. Anyhow. Uh, but the idea being, you have to go through people, or you have to. We, we've, we've mentioned Pauli Maladzi a lot, and you still have to be able to hit somebody. And you know, no disrespect at all, you still got to be able to hit somebody. So it's it's an interesting combination of things that we look at and say, what makes somebody great or good mm -hmm. or or competent, you know? And you can't get hit often no matter how big, great of a chin you have, if you can't hit back. If you can only hit, well, then you got to stop the other guy from hitting you. If you can't jab, you better have something else. Can I defend my Paisan really fast after <laughs> Please defend him, because I don't mean to run him down. Paulie was not, I know, Paulie was not great, not even close. But what I, what I admired about him was the fact that everybody and his brother knew he couldn't break an egg with his punches. 
but he still fought as hard as he could. How do you like to walk in there knowing that your gun is going to fire blanks? Right. Yeah. You know, so you know you got to figure out another way to beat a guy. So the only way you're going to beat him is to move him around and jab him silly and tire him out. I mean, that took tons of moxie to be able to do that. You know, I, I, he had the guts. And then the other part is on the, the flip side is a Rocky Marciano who had nothing that Paulie had as far as movement, but he had the same kind of guts and will, but he could knock people out. So that's all on the Pisons. <laughs> well, Charles, when we, when we look at what you said, jab, defense, and we add that will and, and everything to it, how do you, I'm trying to think of the best way of putting this, how do you train that? Everyone can learn how to jab, can't they? Everyone can learn how to defend. But when you get in and the, and the bullets are firing, how do you train that so you can sit there and go, like the way other go, I'm just going to do shoulder roll, and I don't care how many punches you throw, I'm not worried about it. I mean, when somebody's trying to hit you in the head, how do you train them to be able to do what they do? Well, I think it's about teaching angles. And I think that's what you see when you saw the Mayweathers, you know, they're angles. So it's like, okay, no matter if you come here, and, and they, you swing here, by the time I see you swinging here, I'm already thinking ahead. And that's what they did. They thought about the next move. So even when uh, Floyd uh, fought, I was at the fight, you know, fought when he fought uh, Sugar Shane Mosley. And Sugar Shane Mosley caught him. And then he's like, immediately like, okay, I got hit. And I know I got hit. So now the, the key is to remember not to go back to where I was vulnerable, right? So... What's my defense mechanism after getting hit? He already, somebody saw the puzzle just for a minute, right? You rocked me for a minute. So my defense mechanism after you solve my puzzle is to tie you up, grab you, and not grab you like this, like I'm in desperation, but grab you, your arms and your elbows and just so you can't really hit me, but we're still close enough. So once I feel comfortable with that, and then you go back to your corner because the corner is so uh, on point and they know what it is, and they say, okay, now, the person at the time, Mosley, so confident. Now, we're going to attack his weakness. Because his over aggressiveness, aggressiveness is going to be his downfall. We're going to unleash on him what he thought he already had. So that's what he went on to do. But I think to answer your question is it's about teaching angles. Because you have to understand if you're here, how far of a reach or does a person have to do to be able to hit you in a certain place? And, and the other part, too, is reaction. Because Floyd was here, but he never stayed anywhere too long. It was always a thing where he's always the next man up, which, is, which gave Canelo Alvarez fits. Because he always wanted to time him, but he never could. So when you see, when you go back, if you watch that fight or certain parts of the fight, you understand that. As great as Canelo is and the modern day top match guy, he couldn't figure out how to solve May Mayweather's puzzle. He couldn't catch him. And it wasn't like I'm chasing around, I'm gonna grab you and hold on to you. He could not catch up with the way his moves were and where he was gonna be. Not only that, was he swinging so wildly and missing out of desperation, but as soon as he swings and miss, depending on where Mayweather was, he could pop him real quick and answer him. It's like, nobody does that to me. <laughs> Which shows the greatness of a Floyd Mayweather. But again, it comes down to angles and understanding where you are in the ring. And then not only that, this is where it really is. Last for me, where it really matters is you have to practice it over and over and over to a point where you become so confident that it becomes second nature. That's what it was with Floyd. He really believed I can stand right in front of you and you cannot hit me. But that takes practice, that takes understanding, that takes discipline. It's all of those things. And then after you've done it so long and you go above and beyond what's normal, then you, you start to gain a confidence. And, and it was like, you can't touch me. I, I, I tell you I know how good I am, but in your mind, you know how damn good I am too. It's a confidence. And that is just like anything you do from basketball, any kind of sport, you're so comfortable with where you're at. Like they say, everything slows down because you've been doing it for so long. Practicing this is second nature. So I know that's a lot, but in that package, that's how it rolls. Okay, so John, how many guys can you think of were that far ahead of the game? 
for a few. Broken record, but since I saw these guys training all the time, and, I, and, and, and as far as in the last 10 years, it was Mr. Ward from Oakland, just because I, I watched him, what Charles was talking about. Bruce Hunter had been working on him with, uh, on things about defense, because he told the story that when, when Andre came into the gym and he was nine, his father said, well, I want you to show Andre how to, how to fight. And he goes, okay, I can show him two ways. I can show him how to be the toughest guy in the neighborhood, or I can show him how to be a, a tough guy who doesn't get hit. And that's the way he was taught, if you remember. He did get hit, of course, sometimes Kovalev, but sure, mostly sure. he did not. Uh, and and, and he, he used his brain. And and, and that, that was the bottom line of, of, of him, is that he, he found a way with, with that, with his, what he had. And, and other guys, older guys I've seen going back in the time, of course, had those particular characteristics. But uh, uh, Andre was the whole, the, the, the mix back. The guy that was also great for a while, I think, was Roy Jones, that we don't mention anymore because of the later later qualities of his right. qualities, the, the knockouts in his career that kind of damaged his legacy. But for about, a, I don't know, five or six years, you talk about a guy who didn't get hit. Right. He turned his back on guys. <laughs> He hit him behind his back because he loved basketball, right? I mean, he was he was so good, like you, what Charles was talking about, and knew it, and they knew it. It was almost ridiculous for a while. It was like they all they were beating him before they got in the ring, and 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 that's that confidence that you're talking about. And and it's too bad he didn't quit like Andre did before something disastrous happened. Right, right. So, Lloyd Jones is the guy that Andre admired and idolized as a young as a young kid. So it's not a coincidence, I don't think. But uh, it, it's those particular um, idiosyncrasies or whatever you want to call it that makes, and then I think it's also athletic ability if you're talking about, you know, I, I got a quick story about the opposite side of, of defense. Maybe you know, I was thinking about what Charles was, was talking about, Frank, was when I watched Amir Khan working with Virgil Hunter, you guys all know Amir Khan, and Amir Khan always seemed to have his head right there on a plate. Right, right. And Virgil Hunter tried, talking about what Charles was talking about, and maybe if he had had him when he was eight years old and brought him up through his, because he had these certain drills that every fighter has to do. He, and I was there and he yelled at him, your head is still up. You're going to get knocked out. I mean, he just said it point blank like that. And, and, and so here's a professional fighter who's a former champion, knowing that he's got a flaw, and he never could fix it. So that angles and all that, and Mircon never could figure out that that part of it. And you saw it against Kel Brook. He had no plan B. And he never did. Plan A didn't go good. So, the, the, like I said, the best example I ever saw, you know, and it's a funny one, folks. I love to watch Andre Berto uh, work out because he would work on his defense more than his offense. And uh, people go, oh, well, Andre Berto, another Andre, but, but, you know, he was a champion. Right. So it was fascinating to watch fighters working on that because they get so focused. They're so lasered. And if you ever watch the really great fighters, the, the, their, their concentration, I mean, they're just zeroed in so much. And then they've got the great peripheral vision. It's like any great athlete, basketball players too. They've got this extra level of, of talent and athleticism they can, lift it up and be able to uh, to uh, uh, do things that mere mortals can't do. Well, when when we're talking about guys that, and I don't know if we meant to get into defensive fighters, but guys that we find hard to hit and working at an angles. And and this is where the, not the, the first version of Manny Pacquiao we saw, but the version after he lost to, to uh, Marquez, like, I have to come up with more stuff. I'm now going to be here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be someplace where you can't. When when I throw, I'm going to end up someplace else after I throw. Yeah. That's what I thought with Lomachenko. That's why I thought he was going to be so hard to stop because he's hitting you from a side and you're facing this way. How do you know what, what, what he was standing right there a second ago, you know, and I think the fight that he lost, he lost sight of that. Now illness, whatever you can say, whatever you want, but that was the, I'm going to stand toe to toe and toe to toe is what worked for him. He was usually, you know, toe to hip bone or whatever. So the guys that are quick, the guys that fight at angles, the guys that are defensive, that's one style of doing. The other style is the brawler who just says, I'm walking right through you. What's the best combination of the two? 
who has been a brawler puncher or puncher brawler who has done both of them so well they could whatever the fight determined they had to do they could do john think of somebody that you went it didn't matter what had to happen he was ready for it. he had an answer for everything well and these are tough questions frank because they're that yes, way they are that's the point they're that way for a few years and then they get well, they lose and then they're, they're not that guy anymore you know I'll, I'll tell you honestly the first guy that popped in my head probably surprised you guys is who was so dominant for a few years and then it stopped was and he could do it both he could brawl and box was like muhammad kwai mm -hmm. you know he looked like he was unbeatable for a while after he beat my matthew Saad muhammad twice broke my heart but whatever he beat him and, I, and this guy can't lose and then here comes michael spinks now there's a guy that can do it. Right. Box and he can knock you out. Ask Marvin Johnson. Right, right. Let's ask Jerry Cody, who he knocked out. So it, it happens, but uh, and they can do it, but that's that's a that's a tougher one. And I'm and seeing I'm trying to think of somebody right now, hopefully Charles will save me here that has that ability is I'm, I can't talk chew gum and think at the same time, obviously. Uh, uh, right now, let's see, throw out some, well, you know what? I just thought of one that actually is surprising and this is because he's changed his style a little bit is Tyson Fury. Mm -hmm. And when he was starting, he was really just a big old bl blummox boxer. He, and then that was one of the complaints. He had no power. Right. And then that was George Foreman, the mummy, you know. <laughs> but Tyson Fury, uh, when he got with uh, uh, Sugar Stewart, Sugar said, look, we want you to punch more. We want you to sit down on your punches and start knocking people out. And since he's been with him, he's been doing it. So uh, he, he's got that uh, uh, ability. And, and I'm, I'm thinking of the heavyweights. And see, there's really nobody that pops up into my brain. Now, if you move down in the division, you start talking about, you see, now Canelo has both those things. Canelo is like a puncher boxer. He can box. The brain is working a little bit now, Frank. He can, he can do that. He can do that. Yeah, really. Cool. He, 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 when he has to, he's like a, a I, I look at him as kind of like a quiet assassin in the shadows. He's just waiting for a mistake and then he pounces, you know. He's not going to go crazy and do all that. But he hits really hard. So that, that takes him away from the, the boxer part that we that we're talking about. The guy like Paul, he probably right. could knock off, Frank, or me, or even or Charles either. He could knock any of us. Well, maybe. Maybe he could knock us out, but not saying anything. But uh, uh, I'm trying to think of who uh, the other divisions. Um, uh, the Charlos are, are, I think, boxer punchers, puncher boxers. I do. They don't knock people out in most of their fights. So most fighters are a mixture. And then we go down to our our, our welterweight division, and Boots is a killer. Boots is a knockout guy, but he can box. And uh, uh, Josh Taylor, who you know was fortunate a few weeks ago, he's he's also both those things. So to get one guy, one style, even the, even the Tank, who's got the nickname the Tank, had to box when he fought that tough little dude that was in his grill the whole time, and he showed he could. So most of these guys, they're much more well-rounded than we think. And that's that's how you stay on top is when, well, if that's not working, I I, I, I got to do this. Now, Devin Haney definitely is a boxer. Everybody's more, I'm going through the, everybody now. See, the brain is he's a boxer one. but then, lubricated. Yeah, exactly. And then Lomo, Lomo was, that was a good one, Frank, because even with the defense, and Lomo is more a boxer than, than a puncher, obviously, and he has been from the beginning. Okay, Charles, I, I know where you should go, but I don't think you're going to go there. So give me that that combination of he can take you out if he has to, or he can just out finesse you or outbox you, out think you, out angle you if you if he needs to. John, did you find that interesting? Did he say he knows where I should go? I'm not sure. Yes. Where go. Okay, just prove me wrong. Prove me wrong, because when I say what I know that you should have said, if you didn't say, you're gonna go. Yeah, I should have said that. So go ahead. That sounds like a directive girlfriend, didn't it? <laughs> Charles is not going to say Joe Calzani, Frank. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to say, oh, oh, well, then I might be wrong. All right. One of my favorite people. Anyway, <laughs> I don't even know that man. But uh, yeah, no, I, when I was listening, I was like, I hope you don't say my guy. I hope you don't say my guy. He didn't say my guy. But um, surprisingly, this might surprise you, Frank, because you think where I should go. But this makes more sense to me when I really look at this guy and his style and what he's shown to you. And nobody really talks about it because they're so used to him 
doing whatever, but he can be a killer, but he also can outbox you and he can do it sweetly. But because of what's happening, nobody gives him the credit. And it's uh, Earl Spence Jr. Okay. Okay. Because it's like, when you think about it, when he had to go over and take care of Kel Brook, right? Handled him. Uh, when he had to really bang with uh, Sean Porter, right? But then you had to fight a Danny Garcia. You had to fight, you know, the Mikey Garcias of the world. He just, whatever it takes on a plate, he can get it done. And if you come along, he will knock you the hell out. But if he says, you know what? All right, I, I mean, I might be off today or whatever. Then I can do it this way. I think he's a perfect example of what you said. I mean, he doesn't always show you that he can be a knockout artist. But if you are on point, if he's on point and you open yourself and leave, mist leave mistakes, he will hurt you. And, and I think the, the Sean Porter fight is clear evidence when he dropped him because they were back nip and tuck. And, and Sean was over aggressive, blah, 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 blah. Oh, 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 oh my God. Really? And Sean was like, oh, man, I had it, I had it. But Earl was like, I'm a lot tougher than what you think. And I think that's the other part of it, too. A lot of people don't really see him as tough. And they underestimate him. But right. when he gets in that ring, he may not be the most elegant speaker in the world <laughs> or the spokesperson for Avon. But when you get him in that ring, that dude, man, he... I, I love him. He doesn't say a lot, but he's very confident in his style, and, and he's really a hell of a fighter. So, yeah, to answer your question, that would be my guy in, in regards to describing what you what you mentioned before. So the combination of a boxer, bra brawler, whatever, and combination of all that would be Earl Spence Jr. Okay. Let's start. Uh, Bud, Bud Crawford. Bud Crawford. You mean Hagan Bud? Yeah, like, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Historically, Charles, go go back in time. Who, who would you think would be in the mix? Oh my God. Uh it's a lot. See, this is John's area because he'd be thinking about all the other people and how they turn. I'll be looking like he's not the hell out of somebody. Um I would say uh you probably already said it before, but uh I don't think he got enough credit for it too, because the brawls he was in and how everybody saw him as a pretty boy with a knockout artist, but I thought he was so much more. And I think that's why nobody really says the guy I'm about to say was pound for pound enough because we didn't see enough of him. People younger don't understand him, but I think he was all that. And that's Sugar Ray Robinson. I, I, I just, yep, when, I, you're right. when, okay. when I, I go, oh my God, he, we we do not, and I'm, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. We need to see more of him. We need to go back and look at more of his work because I saw a little bit more of his work and my mouth dropped to the ground. I was like, so that's what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sugar Ray Robinson. That's the reason why he was the first one really called Sugar. I was like, I said to myself, wow. And I apologize. I said, rest in peace, sir. But I apologize. I didn't know. But I know now. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, where, where I thought you would have gone or you should have gone. Oh. I even said, and, it, and I even said, oh. who would you put in the mix? Yeah, but no, no. See, that's a different, that, and I say that because that's different to me, okay? Okay. You know, when you say boxer, puncher, I get brawler, whatever. Aaron Pryor, as you're going to mention, was clearly a brawler. But when you, when I think of boxer, I, I know he could box. But I don't consider Aaron Pryor, and I love, you know, I love Hawk time. I love Aaron Pryor. I always have. I like his style. I would, cause I don't think he fits in that. He's more broader than he was anything. He was constant motion. Did he have some boxing skills? Yes. I wouldn't really consider him a nice combination boxer brawler. I would call him a guy that, the reason why he was he seemed like he really boxed better was because he was so he was even more than Pacquiao. He was so damn unorthodox. Yep. Which yep. is why that alone, he was when you tip and, and you throw the angles in there. He was always over here. He was so unorthodox that it was very difficult to get a read on him, which I don't really consider that truly boxing. I do to a point, but I think his unorthodox style was so much that the average guy, even great talent that he faced, had a hard time. And, and as I get off this point, 
one of the perfect examples of what I'm talking about is Alexis Arguello. He was amazing. One of the greatest fighters we never had appreciation for. But when it came to Aaron Pryor, Pryor had his number. And, and I'll say this, which is why I don't think some of the welterweights wanted to fight him. Sugar Ray Leonard didn't want any of that smoke. Sure. And Thomas Hearns wanted nothing to do with it because he defeated Thomas Hearns in the amateurs. So they, for whatever reason, they say he's too little, too small. I think those two gentlemen didn't want to have a damn thing to do with Aaron Pryor because they couldn't figure him out. And the reason I go there is because a classic boxer was Alexis Arguello. And in my mind, Aaron Pryor outboxed Alexis Arguello. Yeah. I mean, not just outboxed him, outboxed Alexis Arguello. So that's where I go there. Now, and then in other fights, he just got in there and rah, 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 in that fight. And yeah, he's thrown from weird angles and punches you going, that can't, what, what is that punch? I don't even know what that punch is half the time he's doing. But he knew his angles. He knew what he was doing. And in my mind, that was a botch. And I know what you're saying. I agree with you to a certain extent, but it doesn't mean you just have to be boom, 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 boom. I think that he he outboxed him, and that was one of it. John, correct me if I'm wrong. That was one of the best boxers on the scene at that point. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I go there. But again, this is subjective. We can come up with things all over the place, and that's why you look at guys that that throw from angles. You know, was uh, Pernell Whitaker a great boxer? Box. Great defender. Yeah, great defender, great boxer. And he wasn't going to, I mean, he got knockouts, but it was like, after the guys are like, quit hitting me, I'm done with this. So, but not a, not a huge puncher. You right. flip around and say maybe Melter Taylor, great boxer, great defender, great puncher, but susceptible to get hit. You know, so you there, there are all these combinations and it's very hard to win a fight, or I'm sorry, hard to lose a fight if you don't get hit. Well, really Pat, Frank, don't forget Willie. Really. Yeah, Willie really Pat, yeah. Fucking brawler, so I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking if brawler boxer, there's not very many of them that can go brawling, except maybe like Roberto Duran. Roberto Duran could box a lot better than people thought. He proved that in his 40 year career, but he could brawl. If you remember in the 70s, the hands of stone, he was a brawl when he had it. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, my, my guy here, Carlos Palomino, could get in there and brawl, but he could also box. So in that combination, but a guy like Willie Pep, he was a he was a poly before a poly. He could box, but he was just a better boxer. He was so fast. So it's hard to it's hard to combine. See, and I, even Sugar Ray Leonard at times would brawl. Yes. Oh, he would. He, he boxed really well, but he could also he get in there. You fight, you see him later in his career against Donnie Lalonde. He's not really boxing anymore. He just throw makers at Donnie Lalonde. Donnie Lalonde heard him a few times, right? Early so, in his career against Benitez. You know, he, he didn't he didn't box with Benitez. He he figured out what he had to do and went after him. So yeah, uh, that's that's where we're going. That's just where I was thinking we were going with this. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, don't keep going. The sad, sad thing, real fast. The sad thing about Sugar Ray Robinson is they don't have a lot of films of when he was at his peak, which was in the forties when he was welterweight champion. We see him as the middleweight champion. He's already over thirty. He's all already had way over a hundred pound of fights. You know, we we say, oh, guys had forty fights. He's done. He's in the 150s by this point. He's not the same guy anymore. He's still good. We see that, like Randy Turpin and all that. That's not the same guy that dominated in the 40s. And they wouldn't even give him a shot at the title because he was so damn good. We fought Tommy Bell. So, yeah, it's too bad. It's unfortunate. Well, and the, the, I mean, the, the way it, this is, I think the difference between this and MMA, and I'm not knocking MMA, but we have in boxing, you can go a couple different ways. In MMA, if you can't go on the ground, you're going to be in trouble. If you can't throw from, you have to be able to do a little bit of everything. But you mentioned Conor McGregor. You mentioned a couple other guys. You go, yeah, well, I don't know what they're doing half the time. I don't know what the skill set is. Well, he's Brazilian, jiu-jitsu, whatever. Yeah, but it all ends up looking the same at some point. I think when you go to a boxing champion, you have to be able to not get hit. Some guys can get hit and still survive. There aren't many of them, that, as we mentioned, that go for a long time. But you can get the belt and keep the belt for maybe a couple of years, and then it just, you've taken too many punches. But if you're that guy that can keep from getting hit, can throw that jab, as Charles said, to keep people off of you and to create space, 
And then you have what John said, you have the will and the, the thing, craftiness to get yourself moving. I, you know, I think you have to be well-rounded. I think it's, you know, you can't just take them on the ground and pound them. You can't just, you, you got to do all this stuff. Yeah, please, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Farmer's first truck. I appreciate that. The, the, the distinguished gentleman from... I, I appreciate that. Um, I just want to I, I just want to make a point, though, and I know you're not a big UFC fan, but I, I don't want to discount that too much because I, I watched enough, I watched enough UFC because I like the guys that are in the ladies, too, that really are are, are dominant and I do think though while I'm, I do like boxing better because I think I, I agree with you when you talk about the skill set but I think USC for the, the really solid ones is a little bit more uh, sure. oriented and, and the reason why I say that is because boxing at some point for the really talented individuals is very though UFC is a lot more similar to boxing I mean it's totally two different things in sports right but when you mentioned about there's defense in play, right? There are some people that know, okay, you're trying to hit me. I'm going to go back over here. And you're right. There are some people that go straight to the ground and they're better wrestlers than they are, or what they call grapplers, than, than they are people that throw punches. So the really good good player, good people, they are, um, they have a combination of some things. They may be better, like, you know, they might be better at some things like a jabber or more of a brawler. And one of the things I want to, people want to talk about is, uh, who came up from struggling early on to finding their way and became one of the top champions is Amanda Nunes. They call her the lioness. And she was like one of the smaller ladies, you know, between the lightweight and whatnot, uh, going from 135 to like 140 and some change. And she was smaller and she was a striker, but she also could, could get on the ground. But she was kind of in between like that brawler puncher you're talking about. But she never had anything you make you just go, oh man, she's so great. But she evolved to a point where she was the only one of the few people that would fight the best. She fights certain people. Then she's like, okay, I'm fighting Ronda Rousey. Take her down. Then they had a, a, a lady that they call Cyborg. And she's supposed to be the next greatest thing that was a killer and a monster. And uh, she was a lot bigger than the lioness, AKA Amanda Nunes. Nunes gets in there, starts jabbing and thinking that she's going to try to take her down. And she literally told her, I'm knocking your ass out. <laughs> this big woman, and she, boom, hit her. So my point of it is, I think there's, it's a lot more closer than the casual observer may have. Some of the, the talented skills that you mentioned, the top guys top, and ladies in UFC have, because they recognize it. Again, when you talk about another thing is the angles and the timing. Because some people make kicks or they swing around and they, they miss, and you see them waiting, just kind of like you would watch a Floyd Mayweather. And when it's time, they it's not luck. They strike right on point, and they hit. So I think it's more or less understanding the sport more. And right, right. More, and then also watching the greats. Because I thought when I'm coming into it, I used to think kind of like the same way. So I started watching, and I was like, my God, can you just not stop that? And it's like, but again, the last point on this is, the other way that it's really closer to boxing is, and this is real key, styles make fights, definitely in the UFC. Styles make fights. So you have a guy come in there, you're like, well, he's not a great wrestler. <laughs> he's going gonna, gonna to do well on the ground. Same way you go, well, in boxing, he doesn't have good defensive skills. If he catches you with a shot, yeah, you got a chance. But if he, if, if he gets past the second, third round, he's going to get knocked the hell out. I think that's where the two sports are very similar. I think in, in, in MMA, you have to make quicker decisions because you have to decide, is this a jab? Is it a kick? Is it a punch? Is he kicking me in the face? Is he kicking me in the leg? I mean, you have to be able to read a lot. In boxing, there are two hands. If you don't see a hand, it's probably going to hit you someplace where you can't see it. If you've got two hands here, what's going to come? You don't have to make as quick of a decision because if I've got my guard here and I've got my guard here, there are things that you've already taken away. Now, having said that, guys are getting hit by stuff all the time. But I think in, in MMA, you've got to guard against so many different things, and he just took me to the ground. Now i got to fight from this position. i got to fight from there. There's a lot more that you have to do decision-wise. And But I think the smarts of it is how do I land this punch when he knows this punch is coming? How do I land a punch upside his head when he knows that's what I'm trying to do? That's what I see in boxing. So you have to be, as, as we say, craftier. 
most of the time. You just usually you just can't walk in and just bludgeon somebody to death. You actually have to know what you're doing. So, you know, there's a there's a there's a yin and yang there. And I understand what you're saying. I again when I when I say that I don't get MMAs because I haven't tried to get it. Mm -hmm. So that might have something to do with it. So, you know, was we yeah, I know, I made an admission. Sorry. Um now when we're looking at um real boxing talk and i know we've gone around it a little bit here but john when we say real boxes who's a, i mean just a real fighter who who out there right now we go this guy understands it i know we kind of danced around but who 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 would you say this guy gets it well uh, again you qualify what you mean about real sure that's what some people might say this means real we just talked about it the real guy is Chocolatito. He is the real epitome of what a fighter is to me. Not just because he's so good, because of those other intangibles we were talking about. Yeah, he got knocked out once. Does that mean he has a bad chin? No. He got hit by Gonzalez with a number of shots, and he barely blinked. Even with Canelo yelling, glowing like a crazy man right in the front row there, cheering on his countrymen. So... Uh, yeah, right. Right now, he to me, he is he is everything that you should be. If you look at the other guys, uh, uh, I, I, you know, Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury will fight those guys, but I think he thinks ah, I can beat those guys with my one hand. I buy my back, so it's not the same thing in a sense. But they can't help it. Like they always complain about Rocky Marciano. Oh well, Joe Lewis was past his prime. Ezra Charles. Well, you can't help it if that's when those guys are at that point in their career. That's not your fault. So Tyson Fury can't help it that basically the heavyweight division is pretty damn weak, to be honest. So it's not his fault. He's the best in that division. So he he tries to be what what I think you think a, a, a guy should be, and in the in in, in the in the other divisions. Uh, Errol Spence, who, who Charles mentioned, I think he, the only thing with Errol I have a problem is he doesn't fight enough. Right. And, and that goes with our guy, Gary Russell, who said, you know, he's going to fight a lot. And you don't really know. That's just an individual decision. Some guys, so that, does that mean that he lacks desire? No. What does that mean? He doesn't want to work that hard all year round and not fight? All, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's really up to, up to him. He has too, so right. You're right, and he had retina, you know, his eye surgery and everything. Uh, so, but even before that, Frank, he wasn't yeah, fighting. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know what it was or is, or maybe he's satisfied with what it is. But again, everybody has their, their whole thing. That's what makes boxing uh, an enigma nowadays. Back here I go again, the old man, the old grader, back in the day. Back in my day. They used to fight a lot. And I've said in numerous times how many guys, you know, how many times these guys fought. I remember I just wrote something on uh, Ron Stander, who died, you know, yesterday, and, and fought Joe Frazier as hard as he could. He fought ten times in 1970. Again, that isn't as many as other guys did in those times. But if we said to Terrence Crawford or Errol Spence or any of those, hey, why do we fight ten times this year? He go, Are you crazy? Are you crazy? I'm going to fight ten times this year. So it, it just it just comes down to. To that and then it just ties into what we were talking about last week, Frank and Charles, is that that career legacy versus your career, risk versus reward. I think nowadays guys are much more calculated about what they do versus those days. And I'm not compare well, I'm comparing, but whatever. Right, right. They just they were just fighters. Yeah. Uh, now they got okay. Well, now I don't want to. I don't want to risk that with him when I got this. Like like again. Canelo, okay, he's fighting Baval. That, he can lose to Baval. That's going to be a tough fight for him. Baval's a big Russian, and the Klitschko's are mad at him. So, you know, he's going to have a lot of pressure going into that fight. Uh, but he knows he's going to beat Gennady Golovkin, who's as old as me. So, you know, I mean, it, it, that one's more of a, just a, a payday for him, unless somewhere Golovkin finds something. He needs to talk to Chocolatito. But uh, so he, it's just one of those things where... It's hard nowadays, and I think that's why a lot of people have given up on boxing because, and that's I hear it all the time, is that the best don't fight the best. And that's what we've been talking about for years on this show, is it gets frustrating for people uh, when that doesn't happen, and I totally get it. 
and that and that seems to be the, the major thing is that we're we're clamoring for something and that's what they're not giving us and if you look at it again this is why the mma thing and charles can maybe expound on that a little bit is that there's you fight who they tell you to fight or you don't fight if you're in ufc you've got one governing body telling you this is the match we're going to make and if you want to step out on it fine we'll fun find somebody else but guess what you just went to the back of the line does that is that more or less the way it is i'm no doubt because i mean this dana white show particularly in the ufc he tells people what to do he signs the contract and if he doesn't like a fight he says i'm not paying for it so you don't get to walk away with that. You don't get the opportunity, to, even though you're a champion, you don't get to dictate to him what he's going to put on TV. And, and that's where they are a little bit more. You don't see these guys on UFC walk around talking about, brought to you by, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, Miles Vidal production. Right, right. No, that doesn't happen. It's like this Dana White, and, and it's, he runs it, and he's shrewd like that, and that's how it is. But boxing, everybody's trying to follow the, the Floyd uh, you know, example, but yeah, UFC is a different drum, a different type, type of ship, uh, type of ship, uh, ran by a certain individual who knows he has the power. Well, you know, the thing that I find interesting about all of this is that we're still watching, mm -hmm. no matter how much we want to make it better or we think it should be changed, we're still boxing. And as I've been talking to fans of different sports in the last few weeks, months actually, that's the thing. So as long as we keep it interesting and keep it alive, which I hope that we're contributing to that some kind of way, it's still going to be worthwhile. And when we mentioned, or I mentioned years ago, or a couple of years ago, whatever it was, that was boxing dying, I didn't want it to die. I didn't want it to go away. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. It's just that it's evolving or devolving, or however you want to put it, into something different. And that's what I think we're, you know, I don't want them to do that. We're, we have to fight that thought of it's going to be different. You know, the, the the Jake Pauls of the world or whatever. We don't want that, and hopefully we don't get that. But if it brings more people to the party and it keeps, you know, as we mentioned, the undercard is pretty good, maybe that's something we have to deal with. I don't know. There's so many different things we can look at. So, John, close the show. I, I don't have anything else good to say. Oh, can I say one thing before I close the show? No. <laughs> Yeah, the professor's dissecting down there, so let him. Okay. <laughs> you asked John a question that I was hoping I get to address, but I did not. But I'm still going to ask. Well, you know, it's my policy not to ask you both the same question. But go ahead. I mean, that's what makes it so sweet because people want to say John said this. We want to hear what Charles had to say. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna appease my two fans. Thank y'all, yin yin yang. Thank y'all, babies. <laughs> 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 If I, when you think about the boxing, a guy that's the epitome of boxing right now, I mean, to me, I'm thinking about all these great talents and whatnot, but the one guy that sticks in my mind, because I'm excited about where he possibly could go, but he's showing you right now, damn it, I got it. And you see me, you know I got it. Shakur Stevenson, man. He he has it. He, yeah. Early on, he's improved so much more than when he first entered. And, you know, he was working with Andre Ward and whatnot. He was a totally, he's a totally different fighter than he was, now, than he is now. And I think he, he has it now. He understands it. And it's not so much he needs somebody else really to tell him about it now. I mean, he still needs people to kind of be in his corner, kind of guide him along, you know, like what Virgil did for, uh, you know, for Andre Ward. But when your fighter gets it and he knows what he's capable of, he just might need a reminder. But uh, I cannot wait for Shakira Stevenson to keep rolling, growing, because I – the way that he comes at it and his skill set alone, I think he has some power that people don't really understand. I really do, some, some hidden power. But I think he has so much of a skill set that when he starts to go against some of these other guys that we've been pumping up and are coming up along the way too, I think that's when he's going to showcase his skills and he's going to make boxing even better. So I, I cannot wait. I mean, I don't want to push him too quick, but I'm like, man, go on and fight. Go on and fight. Uh, yeah, go on up there and Show what it is. I, I I am waiting. You know, that's one of the one people, one part, one guys. I really want to. I look forward to seeing in the future. As long as he stays healthy and stays out of harm's way, I think he's gonna give us some fabulous bouts and he's gonna give us some uh, rememberable moments. Well, John, that's a guy that if if he was fighting in the or, or doing business the way everyone else is doing, there's no way in the world if he's some of these other people we've talked about. 
he's taking this Oscar Valdez fight. And yet he has. So that's that's and kind of that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not ducking someone or or just saying I can take an easier fight because Valdez is no joke. So well, this is. I'm to, sorry, be, to be fair, you have to give it to both of them because they both know this. Sure. Is sure. Good point. Now, this is something that a lot of guys don't do nowadays because this is an L. This is an L that is in, maybe not in the back of your mind, but it's possible. Right. And that's what makes it such an intriguing. All right, and real fast, and then go ahead and finish, Frank. Is the other guy, the young guy that I'm really excited along with Shakur is Boots. Boots has got my boots moving every time he was fighting because I want to see that. And uh, those two young guys are, are taking over the, yeah, the older guys, and, and that, that's, that's fun. So go ahead. I'm sorry I jumped in, Frank. No, that's all right. Go ahead and finish. Okay, well, it, it, that's a great way to finish because that's what I was going to say. We're moaning and groaning and complaining like we like to do. You know, we're wine, where's the cheese and all this stuff. But next month... We got some dandies coming up. Yep. We got what we complain that we don't get very much. We got some matchups, especially with Oscar Valdez and Shakur Stevenson, especially with Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. Yep. Tyson Fury and Gillian White, interesting, not, not earth shattering. Errol Spence and uh, Ugas, interesting, very interesting. So if you're a peripheral boxing fan out there, and you want to see some interesting, intriguing, hopefully compelling fights that are different in all ways, big guys, smaller guys, different styles. Next month, April, starting early in April, we got it every weekend. We got damn good fights. And, and that is what I hope helps boxing. And yeah, and please, anyone out there, do not, if you're going to miss a few fights, you can miss a few, but don't miss your pure Stevenson and Oscar Valdez because that is that is just this is perfect, Frank. Shakur Stevenson is trying to become more of the boxer. He's a boxer, but he's trying to become more of a puncher. And Valdez was a puncher who's trying to become more of a boxer. Right, right. You have these styles meshing. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you think, that is going to be a damn, it might not be the most exciting fight, but it'll be the, one of the most skillful fights that you'll see in a long time. And that's what we're looking for. So in, in, in the next month, maybe not as much exciting stuff, but guess what? We're exciting. We'll make it work. Keep on swimming with us. We'll get to the next month. So thanks, folks. We appreciate it. Look, we love to talk about boxing. We love to talk about real boxing. And somehow that's why we named the show what we did. The Real Boxing Talk, something like that. So there, ta -da! we actually have made some sense. So thanks again, gentlemen, as always. And we will talk to you later.